the subject, I said, well, you know, tell me about yourself, because I really didn't know much about her background. She said, well, you know, I grew up in Brooklyn, and I always liked to, da to dance. In fact, she said, I used to go dirty dancing with guys from the wrong side of the tracks. And I literally dropped my fork. And I said, that's a million dollar title. She said, what is? I said, dirty dancing. She said, you're kidding. And so she said, but that's got nothing to do with the story. I said, that's the title. And now we'll sit at lunch and figure out the story, which is just what we did. Johnny Castle was invented at lunch over between the breads. It's too bad the restaurant isn't around now. You know, you could maybe have another inspiration. But at any rate, she, we sat there and began to you know, discuss it the way a producer would work with a writer. I had the title. I mean, she didn't know she had the title, but I grabbed onto that title and I said, tell me about the music. Eleanor knew the music. I didn't know that music. And I said, what's the musical contrast? And so she said, it's between clean teen music, which opens the film, you know, go into the chapel, that, all of that stuff. It's between clean teen music and the dirty dancing music. So when I understood it, you know, that that was the contrast and that was going to be the plot line of it, that between that, uh, those two kinds of music, and it was sort of clear that we had to ha we had a love story. But the main reason, you know, I had to try and sell people on this. I said, you know, I thought it was a girl's story, a girl's coming of age story, and girls weren't represented in movies. You know, this was the script was commissioned. It, it, we worked on it in '85. It got, uh, you know, I had a go ahead on it in '86, and um, it was. But when all the rejection letters were kind of fascinating, there were these studio heads, they were all men, every single one of them. And they said to me, it's a small film, it's a quiet film, um, it, but above all, it's very small, and it's soft. And I thought, oh, I get it. These guys want big heart films, you know, figure it out. These are guys, <laughs> they don't understand small and limp, God forbid. You know, the truth was they really did not think that girls' films, films directed toward women, had any, had any uh, market. And they also thought that um, it had no foreign market. That's a big consideration these days. It always has been for films. And I didn't think it had any foreign market because humor and th there's, it's so specifically American. Turned out the movie was a major hit all over the world. Strangely enough, only two countries uh, it, it, it failed in. One was France, and the other was Japan. Who knows why? I have no idea. But it was a monster hit over the, wor all over the world. It defied expectations and continues to. I mean, it's just to m 37 years later, this film is still playing. I mean, it's still streaming. It's playing, which is, I mean, if, if you could have told me in 1987 that I'd be sitting at the Bedford Playhouse <laughs> in 2024 watching this film, I, I, I would have thought you were smoking something. I mean, it's really unbelievable. Mm. So how did you pick Patrick Swayze and Jennifer Grey? And there's, there's some rumors that maybe the chemistry that we <laughs> clearly see was That's acting. maybe not always there. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you. Um, <laughs> we cast... I knew that Pat, I happened to, to know that Patrick was a trained ballet dancer. I knew this because I had been thinking of using him for something else. And so I sort of wanted him from the beginning. And then Jennifer, we did a sort of an open call. And <laughs> I saw um, Joel Gray sort of push her into the room. And Jennifer was auditioned. She was so adorable. She stood there before she was supposed to start dancing. She stood there and she said, I know I'm not supposed to say anything, but this, right, this is exactly like me. This girl is exactly like me, and I know everything about her, and my father said I shouldn't say this. I'm sorry. And she stopped, and we all looked at each other, and we thought, we have our baby. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> she did dance and do all those other things, but she really was that character, and we were so, so lucky. And so we cast her, and then somebody said to me, you know, all was not quiet on the set of Red Dawn. They had just worked together. Well, it turned out that they really did not like each other from that, from that uh, film and that they were, you know, not happy with, with having to work together. And um, so, and that was the case. I mean, they were very, very different types of actor. I mean, Jennifer was instinctual all emotion, she cried easily, when things didn't go right, she would weep. Um, she had very little discipline as an actor in that 
you know, you could do 10 takes and she would do 10 different things. Patrick was a dancer. He was trained as a dancer, trained in discipline, and so he could do the same, he would do the same thing every time. And you know where it shows up in that sequence where they're rehearsing for going to the Sheldrake, and she raises, uh, he, he puts, he strokes her arm and goes down like, you know, like that. He's, he's teaching her to, and she, th th that take where she starts giggling was an outtake. I mean, she was not supposed to do that. <laughs> but, you know, em Emil was brilliant. The director, he just said, keep rolling, keep rolling. And they would do it again and again and again. And he was really pissed off at her, as you could see. <laughs> and, and again, in the sequence where they go over the log, we actually used a double because Jennifer was scared to death. She would not do that balance scene. And Patrick wouldn't hear of using a double. I begged him to use a double because I thought, oh my God, if he falls off that log, you know, d horror, horror. So he insisted on doing that and he just made fun of her for, you know, not, not having the guts to do this with him. So all of that was going. And then finally, when she had to do these scenes kissing, she would run back and she said to me, I hate the way he kisses. <laughs> Go figure. I mean, the rest of the world thought it was pretty goddamn good. <laughs> she was a really good actress. You can she tell. Was a really, <laughs> she was a really good actress. Um, so I know the audience probably have some questions. I have a couple more, but shall we open it up? Linda, it is a great pleasure to meet you. Uh, I have followed Dirty Dancing since I saw it in 1987. Oh. I, have, I want you to know that, bless you for making this movie. If you hadn't made this movie, you would have ruined a whole lot of people's lives. <laughs> I have a Dirty Dancing group on Facebook, and I have over 10,000 members in that group from all oh over the world. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my With goodness. With me today are three more, uh, oh. Stacy, Barb, and Sandy. Oh, and hello. Sandy and I came from Virginia, North Carolina, to be here today with you. Oh, wow. Wow, wow, wow. wow. Well, thank wow. you. Thank we you so We are dedicated much. Dirty Dancing fans, and thanks to you, we have Dirty Dancing. Oh, well, my goodness, thank you so much. I have to now tell you the funny story. When we made the film, you know, we were looking for a place to shoot it, and all the, it was a summer where everyone stayed in America. For some reason, gas prices were low, and you couldn't find a hotel. And we sort of found this uh, uh, lake lore, uh, this mountain lodge in Virginia, and the question was, would we be able to make a deal with the people and I thought, oh my God, this is a script about abortion, and this is a, you know illicit love, and a teenage girl. Uh, what am I going to do? And this is the land of, you know, very conservative people. So I retitled the script. I put a new title on it. I didn't call it Dirty Dancing. I had a script that said Dancing, Dancing. with a little exclamation exclamation yeah. mark. And I said, it's sort of like an MGM musical. <laughs> and so, and they, find, and they let us use the hotel. I think they were shocked when the film came out and have been living happily uh, from it ever since. They have, as you probably know, they yes. have Dirty Dancing Weekends. They have seven of them. Oh, my gosh. They just added two more Dirty Dancing Weekends, and I usually go to every one of them. Oh. And oh I have met people from all over the world. Oh, that's so heartening. Thank it was you. this weekend, and we missed it oh. to come see you. Oh, well, I hope it didn't disappoint wow. you. <laughs> Thank you I so much. I have one favor to ask of you. Yeah. Sandy and I brought scripts. Would you please sign them for us? Oh, it would be my honor. My Thank pleasure. you so Thank much. Thank you so much. My and goodness. So in response to that comment, I just wanted to say, I, I was born in 84, and so this movie had a big VHS thing, and I remember having the tape on soundtrack, <laughs> the soundtrack on tape. And so I used to have a pink... Um, dress up dress I would wear and run into the arms of my sister who's 11 years older than me. She was the teenager in the 80s. And then now I just wanted to share I have my daughter here oh. who's 11 about to be 12. So how it is intergenerational. How did, she, how, did she, how did she like it? I don't know. She saw her? it when she was five and I remember all the serious stuff you know just went right over her head. But let's see what do you think of it? I think it was amazing. Like it was very like just very relevant problems with like just well I'm I'm a ballet dancer and it was just like really fun to see all the dancing plus just all the relevant problems thank you so much for telling us That's that so great <laughs> so we have um, one of our board members is in the in the film industry and we were bemoaning you know not having a lot of great films this year to bring to the I mean we've 
we've had many, but not as many as we would have loved. And he said, well, you know, now that the finance guys run Hollywood, <laughs> that's what's going to happen. Like, can you can you speak to like the, just that change in film? And do you have a message out there so that more of these kind of films can be made? Well, it, um, I think your board member's right. Um, <coughs> the whole the industry is so changed. Dirty Dancing would never be made today. It just is not the kind of middle today, even middle range movie that gets made. You know, you, I think you have art films, independent art films made for really you know peanuts, and they're wonderful, and I love them. But but this kind of a film, which really had aspirations to be a broad market film, uh, but was made for peanuts, that that n nobody's making that anymore. They want to have a high concept movie, a movie that has aliens or AI or something tricky, or they want action films. And it's because those, in a way, those may maybe those middle range movies get made for the streamers, for Netflix and the, you know, all the industry has so changed because of streaming um, that I think studios are, are terrified. They, they don't know what they're doing. I mean, they're trying to buy the streaming services to have an uh, an outlet for their films, and um, I just you know you I can't think of anything like this than sort of small film uh, that's been that that one could point to. Maybe actually you're right. Code is a great. It was an indie film, wasn't it? Yeah, that be that came that that's right, and and also the Francis McDormand film, um, what was the name of it? That won the Academy Award a couple of years ago. We no should, bad. We should end on that positive note that it can still happen. We just have to, as as consumers, speak up and, and ask yeah. for them. Thank you yeah. so much for being well, here. Thank you.